Good afternoon, friends. Good morning, uh, wherever you are, or even good evening, depending uh, which part of the world you're coming from. Uh, we are delighted to have a range of friends and participants who have signed up for this interfaith public webinar on uh, just finance and reparations. Uh, my name is Sivin Kitt. I'm the Program Executive for Public Theology and Interreligious Relations from the Lutheran World Federation. And it's together with the World Council of Churches and the World Communion of Reformed Churches and the Council for World Mission that we are co-organizing this public webinar together. Now, uh, this public webinar is really part of a three-part process where we have two other e-consultations. And what we are focusing on is really on just finance and reparations. And we want to dialogue and learn from diverse faith perspectives and really want to deepen that interfaith cooperation on financial and economic uh, concerns. Now, this is really a follow-up from our ecumenical meeting recently entitled e Economy of Life in a Time of Pandemic, held last April. And, that, and we want to address these uh, following questions uh, for today. First, what do our faith perspectives have to say on the issue of debt and how it affects people's lives? Second, how can finance and international financial structures be made to align with our faith-rooted values? And then lastly, how are faith-based organizations responding and what kind of joint proposals can we put forward to debt action just finance and reparations towards securing a post-COVID-19, post-debt, post-growth, and life-affirming future. So that's quite a lot to cover, and we have indeed a very exciting panel of speakers with us. And I will be introducing them afterwards. Now, it's unfortunate that one of our speakers who was supposed to uh, provide a Buddhist perspective, who was supposed to be our first speaker, uh, and La Papan uh, Sapamanta uh, from the Assembly of the Poor was unable to join, is unable to join us due to uh, technical difficulties. And, and unfortunately, that is the reality that we're in today, often um, hindered by such difficulties. But we are going in alphabetical order so unfortunately, we can't have the Buddhist perspective, but if we can get a video from her later, we will try to make that available to you. Uh, we will start with a Christian perspective, followed by a Jewish perspective, then a Muslim perspective, and at the end, a Rastafarian perspective. Each speaker would have about nine to 10 minutes to, to share. And then afterwards, we will have a discussion with them now, you may use the chat box to introduce yourselves and to put your questions there. Um, we prefer you to use that. And my colleague, Philip uh, Peacock from World Communion of Reformed Churches will be handling that. And we'll use that for the discussion afterwards to make it um, simple. So uh, right now, I would like to start with our first speaker, Karen Georgia. Thompson, and uh, she's from the United Church of Christ, and she will be starting and she will share with us her perspective, uh, uh, her contribution from a Christian perspective. So over to you, Karen Georgia. Yes, good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are here in the United States or in this part of the world. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to be, to be present in this conversation. And my task is to um, provide some insights into a Christian perspective on reparations from an African descendant perspective. Um, I wanna locate myself in this conversation and um, give some insight into where I'm coming from in this conversation. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in Jamaica and I currently live in the United States. So I consider myself somebody who's of double diaspora, multiple diaspora. I am an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ um, with my ordination in the Baptist Church. So in that, um, I walk many spaces and places 
and understand the world from a particular perspective that is um, rooted in multiplicity of understanding and self-identification. So um, in, in looking at um, this particular topic, it is hard to um, come into this conversation and not start from a perspective of African descendant peoples that is rooted in, uh, in enslavement. <clears throat> The history of, uh, of African descendant people, both here in the United States and across um, the Americas, is one that is built on a foundation of enslavement, manipulation of historic truths, and lack of equality and equity. It is challenging to have a conversation about reparations um, without examining critically the commodification and enslavement of Africans and the free labor that they provided on plantations and how that built generational wealth for European communities and contributed to the industrial revolution in Europe. This free labor and exportation of both products from plantation across the American colonies and the Caribbean down into South America supported the wealth generation that we now see quite evident in European countries. The extraction of human and natural resources from the African continent must be a part of the conversation about reparations. Reparations for African and African descendant peoples must include debt reduction and development that will provide relief for our communities in ways that will build the economies of our <clears throat> communities globally. In um, an article that uh, Tanahisi Coates wrote for The Atlantic, he said the following, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy, until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole. That is not only an imperative for the United States. I would say, until the global we reckon with our compounding moral debts, the world as we know it will never be whole. Wholeness in this case includes right relationships. Throughout the Christian scriptures, we find texts that speak of right relationships, about reconciliation, texts that point to forgiveness, texts that point to restitution. And it is in those places perhaps that we need to ground these conversations about debt reduction and about restitution. In the New Testament, we find in Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, compelling arguments about the one body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with the body of Christ. We teach that if one part of the body hurts, the entire body hurts. And yet within this body of Christ, we continue to see the historic abuses of African and African descendant bodies. Within this body, we have also seen the use of script, Christian scriptures to, um, in an abusive way that contributed to actually what we see today by way of um, the plague that is present in many of our communities. The historic uses of the Bible to strip African and African descendant peoples of heritage, culture, and practices of resources and of um, opportunities for human development is also problematic and requires that Christian communities begin to talk about what restitution looks like, not only from a part of um, debt cancellation, 
but also looking at the ways in which African descendant communities continue to be deprived of opportunities to practice cultural and her culture and heritage in meaningful ways. This too is a part of restitution and reparations. In its call for the International Decade for People of African Descent, the United Nations notes that there are 200 million plus people of African descent living in the Americas. Those 200 million people in the Americas are descendants, primarily descendants of enslaved people brought into these parts of the world. The church has a role to play in cause calling for reparations and restitution. And the church has to be a part of providing leadership in this movement for reparations and restorative justice. There is a key difference in our teachings between forgiveness and reconciliation, which we need to acknowledge in this discourse. Conversations about reparations in the church and in Christianity sometimes turn to conversations about forgiveness. Putting ownership of the discourse on people of African descent to provide forgiveness to those who have perpetuated wrongs against them. I would name that restitution requires reconciliation. Asking for forgiveness or demanding forgiveness doesn't get us where we need to be. Instead, I would point to the Zacchaeus text where Zacchaeus stopped and said to Jesus, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. That's in Luke chapter 19 verses eight through nine. Restitution demands that we look at what was taken and find ways of giving that back. Not just one time, but perhaps four times over. We see across communities, unemployment and underemployment. We see lack of education and miseducation, poor housing conditions, lack of wealth and opportunities for wealth generation. And in all of this, we can point to the historic contributions through enslavement that has rendered communities where they are today. So the church, Christianity, has to also look at the ways in which the church profited from enslavement and find its way into the reparations movement and providing restoration for African descendant communities. Thank you. Thank you, Karen Georgia, for um, just um, starting us off and coming in from a Christian perspective, of course. And uh, one of the things that she highlighted that this is not just about debt cancellation, but also uh, looking at issues of culture and heritage. And I appreciate that. And also the reminder of uh, how Christians have misused uh, the Bible and uh, misinterpreted the text and used it in ways that uh, really have enslaved others and given reason and rationale to, to carry out such enslavement. And that is uh, something that uh, we, are de we deeply uh, need to repent of. And uh, also, uh, Karen Georgia talked about Zach Tax. And uh, I guess during the discussion, we'll have more uh, related to that and we can have more discussing that as well. Now, the second person I would like to invite is David Kranz. And David is the co-founder and president of the chairperson of Atzim, Ecological Judaism, and the national, yeah, 
okay, yeah, and a National Science Foundation fellow, and he has many things. You know, just like uh, Karen Georgia, she's the head of the UCC uh, Committee on UN International Decade for People of African Descent. So you have multiple roles as well. So I'm just going to pass the time to you to give us the uh, a Jewish perspective on this topic. So over to you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to, uh, to be with you uh, today, representing both Seam, uh, Ecological Judaism, as well as, uh, as being a National Science Foundation fellow at Arizona State University School of Sustainability. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of nuance that I'll end up having to, um, to, to skip over, but this is just to give you a brief overview, basically what I'm calling uh, kosher economics. Uh, so when we're thinking of kosher economics, uh, we're looking at three Jewish concepts. One is uh, neshach in, in uh, biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew rebit, one is shmitah, and one is uh, yovel. Uh, so dealing with each of these separately, uh, uh, neshach, so neshach, uh, or like I said, in modern Hebrew, rebit, literally means interest. Uh, like uh, interest that one would uh, charge or pay on loans. Uh, so it is actually uh, fairly prohibited in Judaism uh, in our biblical texts, right? So here's all the examples uh, throughout the, the Hebrew Bible that prohibit, either prohibit or, or say that, uh, that to not charge interest is is a wonderful thing, and charging interest is is a is a terrible thing and should be strictly prohibited, right? Um, Ezekiel, in particular, uh, is very much against charging interest. So uh, he says, who is the person who charges interest? That person uh, isn't going to live. If you charge interest, you're just going to die. So it's it's a very very strong. Uh, very strong rebuke against charging interest. Uh, but the other thing that, that uh, neshach means also, instead of interest, can also mean bite, which makes sense if you think about it, because interest is a, is a form of biting financially, right? So here's where it means uh, biting within, uh, within the Hebrew Bible. Now, all of these instances, except for in Micah, biting is actually a snake bite. So it's biting, but it's specifically a snake bite. So interest, charging interest is like a snake bite, um, except for Micah. And Micah, uh, Micah here is a little bit uh, stronger uh, where basically uh, the, the biting or the, the interest per se uh, is a means of people uh, erring and, and, and doing wrong. And what should we do? We should launch war against those. <laughs> so that, that's how strongly the, the Hebrew Bible is against uh, charging interest. Uh, the, the next ideas we're going to go through here are, are Shemitah and Yovel. Shemitah literally means release, but you may know of it more commonly in English as sabbatical, the sabbatical year. And Yovel in English, you probably know of as the Jubilee year. So here's all the instances of Shemitah and Yovel uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. There's seven instances. Uh, so uh, the Shemitah year, the sabbatical year, uh, is every seventh year. Uh, and the Yovel year, the Jubilee year, is every 50th year. So uh, you have seven cycles of seven years, seven Shemitah cycles. And the 50th year is the, the following those seven cycles is the Yovel, the, the Jubilee year. Now, all these are laws that are written in the Hebrew Bible. So to give you a time element, this is the roughly 3,300 to 2,700 years old, these laws, uh, depending upon whether or not you believe the Hebrew Bible was written by God, uh, in which case uh, more around 3,300 years old, or divinely inspired, but not necessarily written by God, and then maybe around 2,700 years old. Um, but either way, still, you know, fairly ancient laws that I'd say are still both uh, relevant and uh, radical today. Uh, so what does it involve? Well, one of the one of the things that involves is a release from work, right? Shemitah means release. So we're releasing lots of things. We are prohibited from working the ground, prohibited from farming. And for an, a, 
an agricultural people to uh, to not be working the ground. For, if you're a farmer and you're not working the ground, you're not working. So it's essentially a year without work in which we're released from work. Uh, we're also released from debt. So all debt every seven years is 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 released. Is it's just if forgiven. So every seven years. Debt is forgiven. Now, again, we, we haven't been practicing these necessarily uh, the way that the Hebrew Bible says we should, but nonetheless, it, it's in there it's in, and it's in our text. Uh, there's also a release from slavery. Uh, slavery in the Hebrew Bible is not meant to be like a permanent condition. Um, it's actually more of an economic condition uh, where people uh, it, it, get debts and then they have to work to pay off the debts. Well, if you're releasing debts every seven years, you're also releasing your basically your indentured servants every seven years. Uh, but that is not enough just to release in Judaism, just to release people who were who were sla enslaved or indentured servants. They must be compensated for their labor. Uh, when, you, when, when people who were enslaved are uh, released, they must be compensated. Uh, and then there's also part of this is a preferential uh, foraging for the needy, as well as a, a redistribution of all land. So getting quickly into all this, right? So uh, we, it, taking a, a break from work releases from, you know, from all work, but it also extends to non-human animals are also supposed to, to be able to take a break. Both the, the animals who would work for you, as well as wild animals are supposed to be able to, to rewild into an area. Uh, this engenders social equity. Uh, a, a release from debt, again, engenders social equity. Uh, all the, 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 the debt over time uh, just leads to divisions within society, economic classes, uh, and the Hebrew Bible says, no, that's not good. We need people more on an equal playing field with each other. This has been the most inspiring outside of Judaism. Uh, Christians in particular have taken this up with things like the Jubilee 2000 campaign uh, that, that uh, relieved and canceled lots of debt, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, it's made its way over into governments have initiated uh, this debt release, again, biblically inspired from, from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's in, been in popular culture where uh, John Oliver last week tonight uh, canceled debt. Uh, it made its way to South Park. Uh, so this is something, the animated TV show. So this is something that's been very much taken up. What hasn't been taken up necessarily uh, so much has uh, been released from slavery. You might think, ah, that's not a problem anymore. Well, actually, there's an estimated 45 million uh, people worldwide who are enslaved right now. That's more than it estimated more than at any time in history. Uh, and uh, we tend not to think about it or do much necessarily about that. Um, the the other part is, is remunerations. Uh, so remember uh, that those who've been released from slavery have to be compensated, according to Devarim, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, must be compensated for their labor. And we have uh, both, we have people who have been descended from people who were enslaved uh, by, uh, largely by colonial powers who were never compensated for uh, for that for that labor and, uh, and and should be so basically we have biblical justification for reparations and it's more than even justification it's it's a, it's command like this is this is just as serious as any other uh, religious edict that we have is that we should be uh, providing reparations for for people and descendants of people who were enslaved uh, and that were not would be in, in Yiddish would be called a shanda a shame. Um, preferential uh, foraging again is something that that uh, it puts people on a on a level playing field, um, and per, perhaps and land uh, uh, land uh, redistribution. This is per perhaps again again something that engenders social equity, but is also something that's probably the most radical law in the Hebrew Bible, because this is something where every every 50 years, the Hebrew Bible recognizes, okay, we, we're, we have a capitalist system, uh, but the capitalist system uh, is, is, is far from perfect and needs, needs a check, it needs a balance. And so how do we balance that? Well, one of the big ways the Hebrew Bible balances that is with redistribution of equity. So every 50 years, equity is reset. People who gained a lot more in, in land, essentially, 
you know, uh, value equity, right? They need to give some up. And people who've lost a lot of their land, they get they lost a lot of their equity, they get some back. Imagine that a social equity system that, that redistributes everything, resets everything every 50 years. Uh, a lot of the problems that we have now in society uh, are generational. Uh, wealth is inherited generation to generation, but also uh, being poor also can be inherited from generation to generation. And the Hebrew Bible says, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, where where things are, are reset and, and things do not get out of hand. We have a capitalist system, but it must be tamed. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you all very much for your time. And I look forward to uh, questions in the discussion section. Thank you. Thank you, David. And of course, even from David's um, discussion uh, sharing just now, you already see how the Bible and earlier, Karen George already talked about the challenge of how we interpret that, that Bible, uh, the text. And here, David also highlighted some of these concepts like Jubilee and uh, where other traditions have, have um, been in solidarity and worked together with our Jewish community to uplift those those ideas so thank you very much david and we will definitely get back to you uh, all the speakers are basically laying out some uh, immediate ideas for us and next i would like to invite um, yusuf and yusuf is the author of the book the way of return responding to economic and environmental justice through wisdom and teachings of islam and of course he also plays other roles uh, as a uh, trainee mufti and translator as well. So I'd like to pass the time to Yusuf for you to share with us the uh, a Muslim perspective. Thank you, Yusuf, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sidin, and uh, thank you to all the attendees and all the panelists. So uh, I'll just go straight into my presentation. Um, given that the topic was just finance and uh, repatriations, um, I wanted to just touch upon the concept of debt. So often um, uh, debt is seen as a negative, especially in, in, in the contemporary world. And so um, the Islamic position is it depends on what the nature of that debt is. And um, I'll kind of refer people, given the, that we're discussing debt, um, I'll refer people to what I believe probably was the, the best book written on this topic. That was um, a book entitled Debt, The First 5,000 Years, written by David Graeber, who, who recently passed away. So the late David Graeber, uh, who was recognized as amongst the leading um, expert, if not the leading expert on this topic, as a financial, financial anthropologist who taught at LSE. So one of the things he highlights is that um, in his book, he says that the whole conception of money um, uh, as, as posited in mainstream economics, is very different from that uh, construed in anthropology, namely that uh, the conception of money actually existed as credit networks. Most primitive economies were gift-based economies where people would gladly be indebted to their brother because that would uh, augment that sense of connectedness. So being in debt to someone wasn't seen as something bad. Being in debt, provided the spirit of that debt was, was good, was actually a way of cooperation and relationship. It was only with uh, the advent, what D David Graeber would say, of coinage and a specific understanding of money. So he's very strongly against what he considers the, the myth, the founding myth of economics, that somehow money evolved from barter trade networks to, to market economies. Rather, what he says was that when specific coinage was introduced in the actual age, this is when, um, basically to coincide with what some of the speakers have said, slavery itself became a big part of, of economy. Um, and so then he touches upon in his book, he provides a whole um, spectrum of this, but he keeps revisiting this concept of how we have a choice. Trade can be seen either in a, in a format of cooperation or can be seen as in a format of, of, of enmity and alienation and separation. And so he very interestingly gives, um, he cites how Adam Smith uh, actually borrowed uh, analogies given by Islamic um, scholars, such as Imam al-Ghazali and Nasruddin al-Tusi, 
uh, which actually were intended to demonstrate that money is a conduit of connection. That as soon as someone hoards money, then they are uh, basically literally embodying a sense of ingratitude for the gift of money, whereas money is being created to be circulated. And that's why the Islamic prohibition of, of, of usury, it actually uses the similar word to um, what David mentioned before, riba, which is kind of similar to ribbit, is an idea of a destructive growth. And so the idea is that when a person keeps the money with himself, even though he may outwardly be benefiting, he is facilitating a destructive paradigm for himself and for the larger environment. Now, what David Gravy interestingly says is that when the Muslims were applying their understandings of, of, of money and the marketplace, they had a certain understanding of how the marketplace should be a genuinely free market and there should be no impediments to entry and to exit. Then he mentions how uh, this could have been, this was actually the, the, the example of a free trade, a free market in operation. And effectively, uh, uh, what stopped them resulting in banks or commercial banks as we would come to know it was because they took their profit seriously and weren't just motivated by profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Um, and so he says that uh, ironically was the development of a conception of interest, which was pre uh, which is previously, as the previous speaker said, uh, condemned uh, in Judaism. Although in the book of Deuteronomy, there does seem to be a a, a kind of a, and this is a very Im impactful verse in this, in the sense that unto your brother, you can't charge uh, interest, but unto the Nokri, which is the Gentile, you can. And so there was a kind of an, a, a, a kind of an understanding of certain people you can charge, and that would be the stranger, the, the, the enemy. And a cr a traditional Christianity, the, such as Ambrose and Ambrose, uh, then expanded that, the famous Ambrosian exception to say, well, everyone is a brother in this world, and therefore you shouldn't charge usury or interest from anyone. The word usury and interest, there wasn't any demarcation. Usury was any form of profit on a loan. Interest was introduced by a Roman jurist, Hispanus, who said interest is derived from the word interesse, which is literally in between is. It was a way of getting around the prohibition of usury to say that if I give you a loan and you don't pay back on a certain date, then that gap allows me to charge you a late payment fee. And it was used as a legal ruse alongside other strategies to get around the prohibition of usury. Um, what David Graeber and other people say was that when finally through um, the Protestant Reformation, and I noticed this is a lot of a Lutheran church here, Martin Luther played a big role in, in readapting the prohibition of usury. Even though he was against usury first, he um, almost uh, as a reaction to the times allowed for 5%. And then the final nail in the coffin was laid by John Calvin. Um, and so when this kind of uh, allowance for usury happened, then what I want to say is that the, the Muslim world could would not have allowed for that because it always understood any charge of money on money is, 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 is bringing about this destructive paradigm. But once that allowance was made, then that in turn facilitated a chain of events, which resulted in in 1694, the world's first, what we would call bank, as we know it, commercial bank, which in the words of David Graeber, inverted all money previously, whereas money previously to that would be a debt owed to the king. Now the money becomes a debt owed by the king because the king of England or the William seeking succession to become the king of England gives the remit to print money to a band of goldsmiths. And this allows for what we, from that trajectory onwards, allows for what we know as bank credit today, whereas money itself literally comes into existence as interest bearing debt. Anytime money comes into existence, and most, most of what we know as money today is money arising through bank lending. It comes into existence at a swipe of a pen or a typing of digits, whereby it comes into existence with there always being more money be left to pay back. Now, and there was a time when post Bretton Woods, when that money was pegged to the dollar and the dollar was pegged to gold, but post uh, Nixon 1970s wanting to remove that in order to facilitate a war, um, that was removed. And so we've arrived in a situation which Herman Daly refers to as growth mania, where there is no effective peg. And the only thing that makes us accept these digits that banks produce today as money today is the supposed understanding that it is money 
which means it's usually ultimately backed by the imperial power and strength of America. So what happens when we're in a system where money is constantly growing and it has to grow to survive? As Edward Abbey says, the logic of usury is the logic of the cancer cell. It has to grow to survive. And just as the cancer cell, as it metastasizes and grows and grows in the body, it eventually cannibalizes the body and destroys it. So it is that our interest-based money, which is arising with always a corresponding debt, has long since divorced itself from the real economy and has become a phantom economy. So we can do as many repatriations and just finance as we want until we realize that the nature of the money supply itself uh, creates slavery, requires slavery, uh, led to um, corporations that were founded on their logic that spread out through the Eastern near company, the East India Dutch company, that resulted in the words of Richard Douthwaite, leading, causing Western Europe, which were the pioneers of this bank credit, to have to colonize the world, resulting in Africa, one of the sisters gave a lovely talk on Africa, resulting in Africa literally being strip mined to the benefit of these Western European countries, then this system continued. So when the colonization ended, supposedly, it only rebooted itself post Bretton Woods to take on the form of multilateral, uh, uh, basically, organizations supporting these corporations. And we're still there today. And we're waiting for the next reboot. What's going to happen when the dollar finally hyperinflates, when we all realize all of what we took to be money was nothing but digits? What's going to happen then? What's going to happen then is either it'll reboot itself, so someone will hope maybe China takes on that role, or it will completely collapse, and then we'll have to revert back to a more honest and just forms of money. And this is where we as faith communities have a lot to give, because we need to revisit the prohibition of usury and translate that beyond our theological and scriptural commandments into real-world understandings where people can see the destruction and the vice that it's caused everyone. Um, and I believe all of us will come to that agreement amongst ourselves. Sivan, how, how, much, how much time have I got left? You have one minute. <laughs> okay, so, so, so I'll end this on this point because um, I think we, um, we need to revisit this thing. I mean, the, the Muslim position is quite categorical and I believe in my reading almost all faith uh, positions on this was categor categorical, but alongside the idea of money not being interest bearing, whether it comes into existence at interest or let's not take interest, but we have to encourage the, the surrounding marketplace that facilitates free and fair trade. You can't have a free market now because the freedom that exists today is freedom to exploit. There's a reason why 50 of the largest embodied economic entities in the world are corporations. There's a reason why Walmart has more GDP than Pakistan and Bangladesh combined. There's a reason why no matter how much we speak and how much we have platforms as faith institutions on Davos or any of these things, we're never gonna be taken seriously because there is a systemic structural uh, impediment caused by the system itself. And we need to call out the system from our faith positions, but also from a real world economic position. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, for uh, really a very rich discussion covering history and also just bringing us back to even the early conception of money uh, that is more gift-based and how the moment we have coins uh, materially, you know, we already it changes the way we look at look at uh, money itself. And also there were a few things that came up, like ideas of cooperation versus competition on enmity, and then later that image of cancer really struck me. Uh, this, that whole whole uh, destructive nature of uh, of our system right now, and I think at the end that you gave us a strong appeal uh, for us to see how our theological perspectives can be translated into actual policies and practices that really make a difference in the real economy, as you have just said. So thank you very much. We will come back. I mean, uh, this is just the start appetizer for us, and I would like to right now invite our next speaker to come forward. Now, Jalani Nia or Naya is uh, the coordinator of the Rastafari Studies Unit and lecturer in Culture and Rastafari Studies at the Institute of Caribbean Studies in the University of West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. And we are really uh, excited to have him with us because uh, unfortunately we couldn't have the Buddhist perspective earlier due to technical issues, but it's important for us to also look beyond uh, what people usually say is the Abrahamic uh, faith, you know, uh, Jewish 
perspectives, Christian and also Muslim perspective. So I think your contribution will be very important for us so that we can learn together. So over to you, Jalani. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of His Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie and his wife, Empress Wazira Menin. I want to express thanks to the councils of Christian churches for this forum and the invitation to address you here. I feel, however, that um, these conversations might be somewhat cliche uh, to address a matter of just finance and reparation, because to some extent, we all know what is good outcome and the level of commitment required to see that through. Uh, it's more than 60 years since leaders of the former developing world met in Bandung, Indonesia. And those conversations continued into frenzied hopes of the group of 77 and various other kinds of regional blocks that tried to engage with this conversation we're having today. This terrain, as far as I'm concerned, is not rocket science. Um, this is a terrain that connects us to human nature and understanding and action. The willingness to live unselfish lives, uh, to harmoniously and equitably share the planet's resources. Rastafari holds the principle that the earth uh, and the, the people who inhabit, the, the creative um, beings that inhabit this space, are a part of a common heritage, um, are a part of a universal uh, heritage that not just mankind, but the whole um, planetary ecology uh, is important and should be sustained. The cliche is the dissonance between the knowledge and the willingness to undertake the appropriate action. In this presentation, I address the approach of Rastafari to these issues of just finance and reparation through a title of polite violence and the proverbial apple, Rastafari and back to Africa as, rep as reparations method. Now, the word in the title, polite violence, speaks to this cliche I'm talking about because um, the, the willingness or the desire to make a change um, feels connected to a theory I was taught by Rasta teacher Mortimer Planner, Polite Violence, which is how he conceptualizes the British colonial civilizing mission. Um, he interprets this as polite violence to speak to um, institutional, uh, strictures that violently damage, subjugate, um, dehumanize uh, the people who were under its weight. The apple I talk about um, is a multivocal signifier, um, not just a reference to the biblical apple, but also alluding to the, the company, um, the largest company in the world and its symbolic name, Apple, um, which connects us to that first sin, um, this notion of um, enticement, this notion of, um, of, of pleasure. Um, but we also see the Apple as the American Apple or the Euro-American Apple, which has been the source of much distraction and the perpetuation of our peoples uh, under uh, development. So first, I'd like to say that Rastafari is notably a new religion and the ordering of the program this morning is not just one that is alphabetical, but one that is chronological. Emerging in the African diaspora in the 21st century, 20th century rather, out of Jamaica, and one that has um, overachieved as far as religious developments is concerned within less than 100 years, becoming a worldview infectiously known across um, the, 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 the globe, um, transcending geographies, race, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and now with adherents numbering anything between 15 and 50 million worldwide. Second thing I'd like to say is Rastafari 
its origin uh, emerges to channel uh, and facilitate post-colonial transformation of subjugated populations, significantly dehumanized by this colonial civilizing mission. Uh, the encounter of Africans who have been transplanted to the Americas and enslaved became narrated as a protracted period of confrontation in the wilderness of the West with a beast which is Babylon, operationalized through combined oppression of church and state working in unison to develop the societies of Europe. Thirdly, Rastafari is a worldview uh, that is a product of fate um, anchored in Christian orthodoxy, which is uh, linked to the trusted fulfillment of the prophetic word. This word became the Redeemer King, Emperor Haile Selassie, whose name translated to the power of the Holy Trinity. This sovereign crowned in Ethiopia became the revelation and symbolic fulfillment of the hope of African redemption and reparation. The constellation of over 400 years of colonial American uh, oppressive colonization after a journey that had begun with emancipation in the mid 19th century, enslaved peoples in the British Empire uh, were guided by the actions of this Ethiopian king. And this provided a focal point for the, uh, the um, galvanizing of uh, African centered international liberation and decolonizing movement. So essentially I'm saying that Rastafari is a product of the post-colonial attempts to transform a colonial situation. So it comes into being with reparations as its intention. Rastafari is very much critical of the kind of Hobbesian economics that uh, suggests that man in nature is nasty, brutish, and thief, and therefore evolved in a kind of mercenary and um, ungenerous context as far as his human community of brothers and sisters. So to this extent, Rastafari uh, jettisons the colonial project by embracing uh, analysis that centers the world on an Ethiopianism that sees the project of world um, supremacy as nations for the concert of nations that we now recognize in the United Nations and all of those developments in decolonization and human rights. Um, indeed, the emperor's leadership uh, perhaps best crystallizes this conversation in a speech made to the United Nations in 1964, made popular by artist Bob Marley in a song called War, where he outlines that until the color of Roman's skin or his eyes are of no greater significance uh, than the color of his um, skin, rather, there will be war. That as long as there are racial divides and uh, other rising of humanity in prejudicial ways, there will be a context for disharmony and war. Peter Tosh, in his usual bluntly stated um, um, conversation, says everyone is crying for peace, but no one is crying for justice. Um, I don't want no peace. I want equal rights and justice. To some extent, I think um, the idea of I don't want no peace, I want equal life, rights and justice should preface the trending hashtag Black Lives Matter, so that persons confronted with this assertion understands its fullest context as um, really a rejection of peace in, in interest of justice and equality. What is the damage that has been caused by um, this Eurocentric white supremacist Christian 
centered um, approach to African dominance in the West. It has caused a sense of um, unbelonging. Africans everywhere they exist outside of Africa are deportable or second-class citizens. Um, this is exacerbated by the fact that there is no African dream. There is an American dream. There are European dreams. So Africans cleave to the West in spite of the fact that they are not necessarily embraced there. Marcus Garvey early provides um, a context for the reparations of the African sense of belonging by insisting that Africans look to the continent, um, look to their homeland, and to create this homeland uh, to give this anchor of belonging. The sense of capacity has also been destroyed by Europe. And I'm not just talking about the penchant for Afro-pessimism as a way of viewing African potential. I'm also talking about the destruction of uh, the capacity to survive healthy lives based on nutritional um, uh, provisions, um, products of slavery, poor diets, which now cause lifestyle issues in the Caribbean. Rastafari and reacting to these um, issues uh, caused by cultural um, genocide has fashioned its own reaction through its liberty, which emphasizes organic food, which is largely described as idol. And idol is seen as a counteraction to the brined entrails that were product of colonial um, dietary nutrition for the enslaved people. Um, I see where I'm running out of time. So just yeah. to bring my conversation to a closure, there is a sense within Rastafari that reparation is an ethos that is necessary as a part of the concert of nations. Um, reparations mean that the pride of old money should move to a similar pride to be um, um, responsible for the issues that arose through their um, acquisition of that money. Money in Rastafari is seen as germs. And this is insightful when we think of COVID and money being one of the carriers of the virus. Just to close, I would like to say that um, international funding agencies will have to decolonize and uh, cease to perpetuate neo-colonial policies and that framework. In fact, um, those agencies really suggest the kind of behavior that we see now operating after the United States, which is quid pro quo, kind of trumping of potential across the world. Um, just finance is not just about finance. It is about fairness, equity, trust, and honesty. Um, and that's what we would like to see going forward. I thank you. Thank you, Jalani. And uh, of course, I know that you could keep going on. And the moment you start talking about germs, suddenly I thought, OK, you, this is something that resonates as we are in this time of pandemic. Um, of course, uh, uh, with all these uh, rich contributions that you have given us, um, I'm going to call uh, all the other panelists to come forward to join us for a conversation. And they may want to come and share with us their what the, what resonates you know, as they listen to each other. Uh, because this is also a learning from one, one another that is that, that we want to have in, in this session. So um, there are uh, four of you and Jalani has shared uh, quite another part that's really important about decolonization. And I was really struck when you talked about uh, the different dreams that we, we all want to have. It's not just the American dream and uh, the images that you use, whether it's Apple or even, I would be interested to hear more about what does that polite violence look like you know, in, in your context, etc. But I'm just going to open it up for the all the uh, panelists, perhaps to, if you'd like to just uh, I've asked you all to unmute, that all of you can unmute to share. Perhaps, is there anything that you, you felt resonated with you when you're listening to one another? And as I quickly comb through the questions, I'll bring out some questions to you. And, uh, and I'll probably start with Karen Georgia first, because I think um, she actually cut her sharing a little bit short. Uh, she was the shortest, but there may be some things that she wanted to add that she, she maybe didn't manage to go to. But maybe as a, as a Christian, you could probably start, start off by sharing 
is there anything that resonates with you as you are listening to others? And what thoughts do you have just to get the, get the ball rolling? Sure. Um, I, they, they all resonated. Um, and it's interesting for four unplanned and um, unthreaded um, presentations that they connected in the way that they did each touching on a different thing and almost building. Um, so that was, that was very helpful. Um, I want to thank David for, um, you know, his um, explication of the Hebrew narratives and talking um, because I think that the texts that are lifted up there um, certainly also are a part of um, the Christian um, story as well, that we do look to the Hebrew narratives um, to, um, to talk about things like forgiveness um, and um, restitution, jubilee, and I intentionally did not uh, touch the, uh, the Hebrew narratives because I saw that David was going to be um, on the program. Um, um, Brother Yusuf, um, thank you for um, your presentation as well, which also I think tied in um, very well with the conversation. And um, Brother Jelani, um, as a, as a fellow Jamaican, um, um, I think that everything that you pointed to, um, particularly around the cultural pieces, um, um, was also something that I lifted up in terms of the, um, the, the need for restoration. I think the piece around um, heritage and culture, displacement of peoples um, in a diaspora context, and the ways in which Christianity has been used to um, as a tool of oppression is something that really needs to be on the table for interrogation. Um, and, um, and there needs to be an act of repentance um, around um, the ways in which um, Christianity has been at the forefront of what we see. I think that um, Christianity, um, when we talk about that, has a particular um, Western, white, Western bent to it, um, and that that's um, oppositional and has been oppositional to um, human rights, dignity, freedom, and justice for all people. Thank you, Karen, Karen George, just uh, getting us started. And, uh, and this is part of the process of us learning from each other. Would anyone else would like to just chip in before I, I ask some questions? And you can yeah. just go ahead, Yusuf. Yeah, I'd just like to say, I, mean, I think, you know, it speaks a lot of Karen to, to raise that in, and, and also as a committed Christian to raise that question. But I think that question also goes broader, right? Because all of us can can use our religions and more so our whatever identity. Can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So we can use um, any religion, um, to to buttress that egoic side if we've chosen separation right i mean the deeper core of, of of our religions require a luminosity for us to see what's really been spoken to there has to be in the words of um of uh jahlani faith fidem right what do you really trust what does it really come down to and so um Christianity was co-opted, Islam's co-opted by other extreme fringes today. But the, the deeper question that I would come to, um, especially when you think of colonization and how Christianity became a vehicle for that, because much of it spread out from Western Europe. Um, and so even the Christianity that was purported to be presented was an ethnocentric, and people sometimes can't avoid that, but the ethnocentric Christianity of, you know, uh, Jesus on the cross looking very much like whatever he, Charles Heston, whatever his name was, blonde, blue eyed, not the Jesus that you'd expect from Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem <laughs> from Palestine. But in any case, um, when we look at these things and we seek to address the, the wrongs that were done, one thing to be cognizant is structurally those wrongs are, are being perpetuated and continuing. And they, and they were continuing because colonization was an imperative brought about by a, a system which required this outpour of greed, which required this separation, right? This is what interest does and it associating financial architecture. So, so the question that I, that I was hoping to pose at the end of my presentation was alongside seeking of justice, 
what is it we can do today to redesign our money and our financial institutions and our architecture to ensure through guidance of our, of our scriptures, but also this felt sense of what's true, that it does become a means of cooperation and connection and can fulfill the Ambrosian idea of universal brotherhood, as opposed to the turning the verse of Deuteronomy on its head and saying, there is no kingdom of God here. So we might as well take universal separation <laughs> and apply this, um, you know, if everyone says, um, you know, America first, then by, by definition, there's going to be someone coming last. So, so that's, that's the kind of, um, uh, the kind of challenge that we face to kind of structure it. So that's the question that I'm going to throw out uh, to the panelists and also to the attendees that what can we do to redesign? For me, the biggest thing is removing, reasserting the prohibition of interest within a paradigm, what we say, the wisdom behind that prohibition has become manifest in our time. We don't need to go and speculate now. We don't need to revert, revert back to some councils. We can see that and where it's taken us where it's taking us environmentally, where it's taking us there. And then we need to support institutions that encourage uh, collaboration and, and unity and the cooperation. Yeah. Thank you, Yusuf. David, do you have anything to add on? And then we're going to go into some, uh, pick up some questions and, and uh, maybe some comments that you all could respond to. And you can see the, the chat that is flooding with different uh, perspectives also. But just a, uh, a word or two from you, David. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to hear from my colleagues. Uh, I was struck, uh, Yosef mentioned uh, America first, and in a way, America is indeed first, first in incarceration, both in sheer numbers and incarceration rates, uh, you know, first in, uh, in, in COVID numbers, uh, uh, in, in, in overall numbers, at least for now still, uh, first uh, in, uh, in, in, in debt, first in all sorts of things that uh, no one should really want to be first in. Uh, and it, it, it strikes me that a lot of this, both the, the problems in the United States and around the world and, and the problems that we're discussing today uh, have to do with, uh, with power and how uh, power corrupts and how power has been used to, to divide people and, have, and to turn people against each other. Uh, and so I think that that a session like what we're we're doing today is is a good part of that uh, of that process to how to how to counteract that. Uh, we counteract that power by those of us uh, with 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 little power joining together uh, and ideally convincing enough people with power to also uh, join with us. And then you know together we can build power, but also a a more just and, and equitable power to reset things the way that uh, ideally they should be to to set things more fairly than they are and and have been. Thank you, David. Now I'm going to just pick out the the questions um, from what I can see here. Um, thank you, Philip, for just. Bring it, alerting me to that. And I'll, I'll go back to Jalani. Uh, and of course, we don't have to go in this order. If you just want to say something, just do the traditional raise your hand. I can see you. And then we can just proceed and engage with one another. And of course, we're not talking about uh, necessarily being nice and agreeing with each other. I'm sure there are some nuances that we, we want to pick on. But Jalani, there was a very pointed question that you mentioned decolonizing financial institutions. And um, so perhaps you could start off and others might have some thoughts on this. Now, what does this mean? Uh, do you have anything you want to say more about it, especially related to reparation? Uh, certainly. Um, in countries like Jamaica, who have been before the IMF um, repeatedly, uh, we usually are faced with uh, conditionalities that are driven by very much alien economic principles. Um, believed to be in the best interest of development. And um, most nations going before this end up having high debt burdens with most of their GDP being exported to service these debts. Uh, there is a, a kind of racist underlying principle that assumes that these countries need to be spoon fed um, through these institutions because they're providing funds. Often their conditionalities as we come to know them are completely um, 
stressful for their populations and, and push huge sections of those um, people into poverty. I, I think that institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank um, need to, to solve the problems of um, the poor without creating more problems. Um, so, so really and truly what they've demonstrated is that they continue to be extractive institutions um, um, neo-colonial ways of shoring up um, uh, capitalist economies um, through that same notion of interest that we were talking about. Um, the, the, the fact is that uh, there is a pride within capitalism in being able to profit off of adversity and the adversity is the poor often. Um, and I'm saying that the decolonization of those institutions really means that they, they need to see the human community as interlinked um, and the, the extremities between um, wealth and, and, and poverty uh, are the, the real substance of most of our issues, you know, um, globally. So I'm, I'm really talking about institutions that are governed differently, are guided by different sensitivities and with an intention to really transform these countries. The third world has never had a Marshall Plan, you know, where America provided funds to Europe to ensure that Europe retained respectability. Um, as far as the third world is concerned, your respectability is your debtedness um, um, and, and being able to crawl out of that, uh, you know, and, and prove that you have successfully attuned yourself to these economics. Would anyone like to add on to, to this perspective on decolonization? Go ahead, Karen Georgia. And I, I, um, I'm grateful for, um, for that global um, perspective um, and how it impacts uh, countries. I think that there's also a way in which our um, lending institutions also disenfranchise individuals in the process and is also a piece of what Jelani is raising here. So um, let me speak to this particular context in the United States where um, individuals, um, you know, African descendant people um, quite often end up with um, loans that are at a higher interest rate or they have challenges actually um, getting the loans that they need. Right. So um, um, we also see this um, when you're talking about issues around, for example, um, wealth creation, right, and people moving out of poverty. One of the issues is also um, here is about home ownership, right? So um, that's a way that you start to kind of build um, um, build assets, if you will, and um, there's a serious disparity in terms of um, how um, um, individuals acquire home loans. Um, in the last housing crash, um, the people who were disproportionately affected were African descendant people and other people of color who had um, an extraordinary number of loans that were given at extraordinarily high interest rates so a lot of those um, loans that ended up um, with balloon payments, um, people ended up losing their homes. If you end up losing your home, then um, it drives you back into um, a particular um, area because you've lost your equity, um, you've, you've lost, now you have to find some place to live. So those particular cycles are also perpetuations of a system that is not built to actually assist um, African descendant people, but actually perpetuates a colonial mindset that says that we need to put more into whatever it is that we need to get and there's no assistance. So we're always gonna be struggling that much harder to get that much further than other communities. Yeah. There was an interesting comment here. And of course, Yusuf, you can go ahead. Yeah, I just want to kind of yeah. give a twist to the to the whole um, idea of the, the colonial thing because I think when Jahlani and Jahlani, when he was speaking about that, this this kind of um, quote came to mind from Neil Ferguson when he was speaking about how post Bretton Woods co colonialism needed to be 
colonialism needed to be readapted. So he said, the days had gone when investors could confidently expect their governments to send a gunboat when a foreign government misbehaved. Now the role of financial policing had to be played by two unarmed bankers, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Their new watchword became conditionality. No reforms, no money. Their preferred mechanism was the structural adjustment program and the policies the debtor countries had to adopt became known as the Washington Consensus, a wish list of 10 economic policies that would have gladdened the heart of a British imperial administrator 100 years ago. This is from The Future of Money. And he's He's quite a big pro proponent of, you know, capitalism and so on. So the point about, for me, um, just to unpack the word colonization, because I get what Karen's saying, what Jalani's saying, but to bring it to a wider audience is that this imperative of colonization was brought about by a system of money. And that is uh, the system of money, which requires money to grow. Money has to grow for its survival. And it, and it has a point of its growing and it's increasing uh, the receded uh, privileged elite, then there becomes a struggle between the haves and the have nots. And it just so happens that the colored people and especially the Afro African people were kind of on that, uh, on the lower end of that curve. And now we find that still being played out within the national economies. So when David, for example, gave the example of America being the most indebted country, he's right but it's also simultaneously the richest country. The only way that makes sense is when you understand money itself comes into existence as a debt and it requires more to be paid back. So when we take out, because the, the way this could play is that when there could be token support systems made, right? So the liberal fringe or the liberal side of what's happening within the power play within America between the Republicans and the Democrats and this kind of polarization that's happening could be, and it needs to be done. There needs to be an empowerment but it could play out kind of as a token form without addressing the systemic reasons, right? So for example, if we replace the color and the ethnicity of someone who's still playing the role of that <laughs> privileged elite, then it's just the same thing acting itself out because it needs this kind of system. It needs this kind of separation and it needs this kind of polarization. So, um, it's really, really important. I, I seem to be banging on that thing again for us to look at the structural causes for this and what are the structural things for uh, for this thing continuing. So, yeah. Just to um, maybe quote, there's somebody who wrote a, quite an extended comment and then a question. Maybe it feels like a pushback, but it would be interesting to see how uh, each of you or any of you might want to respond to this. It, so I quote this, someone said this, uh, it was true that large communities of people were exploited for profit through the colonial machinations, machinations, but will not such a return of wealth in any form create further pressure on the peoples who are already a part of a capitalist system within the same colonial power. In other ways, whose responsibility is the international repatriation. So if England compensates India, will not the poor and dispossessed in England pay the heaviest price? Question mark. Any thoughts on, on that? David, go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, did I, I fear it's also the sort of, of thing that can lead to to inaction, um, but they, they all have the same root of the problem. Like the reason why uh, that uh, you know England is a, it, like the the poor people in England or poor people in the United States or the poor people in any of the wealthier countries are exploited is the same reason why uh, poor nations have been exploited by those same countries, right? So it's it's. The, the root issue is exactly the same. And, and this, you know, hints that really this is a very big systematic problem, right? So it, we, yes, we can develop uh, a little thing here or there, but clearly, uh, it, or even a bigger thing here and there, but clearly if we're not addressing it systematically, uh, that there will be other uh, unintended problems. So a country that doesn't care, you know, for, uh, it's its own people. How you know? How much should we expect it to care for for other people, right? Outside of their own nation. So the, the, there's 
there's an element of, 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 of capitalism unchecked that is just money is about everything and everything else is secondary. And as long as we have that as a societal attitude, I think that you know, we will have problems. Um, but uh, you know, the, I think we, we continue to, to push for systematic change, which is required. And simultaneously, I observe that mostly what we actually achieve is incremental change. Uh, but clearly, if we don't push for the systematic change, we won't even get the incremental change. So that leaves, okay, so how do we get to that systematic change? And I think we can get to that systematic change through pushing for it and then uh, noting our incremental achievements. I'm heartened by the Reverend, Reverend uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who noted that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This is a fight that we will not win overnight. We will certainly not win in this webinar, right? This is something that, that we need to be, be fighting on together. Not, and we're probably not even gonna solve this in our generation. Uh, God willing, inshallah, we should, but uh, we're, we're, we're probably not going to, right? We need to be fighting this from generation to generation and each generation, ideally, we will get closer to where we need to be. I already sensed that Jalani was yeah, having something I, to say. Go for it. I um I'm 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 optimistic. Um I realize that the way global events um unfold, um they're they're epochs. And I I think that sustainable development as an imperative before humanity has to be conjoined with reparation. They're they're linked, they're not separate. Reparations is sustainable development, um, meaning that unless we see uh, the need for repair of damages and to hold responsibility for um, the, the way in the Caribbean, 85% of tertiary graduates migrate to the United States and, um, and the UK. So it means that what the taxpayer of the Caribbean trains as professionals, services the first world, and the first world is not paying for that. We continue to prepare our debt burden, but the first world continues to draw on the brain drain. Um, I, I'm saying that the, the, the way the United Nations exists as a political body of, of nations, um, there needs to be a moral obligation that the larger countries, because we already have all of the, 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 the framework for human sensitivity, for human action. Much of what we have talked about has already been legislated. There are various kinds of subcommittees within the United Nations, but the large countries, United States, Britain, China, Russia, continue to ignore um, the principles of the majority of humanity. Um, I think the church has been complicitous in not being political enough. Um, and and I'm, I'm saying that um, the, the church had a political mandate, which is why we were enslaved. The, missionology, the, the, the missionary work that occurred across the world was to support the state's um, hegemony of, of subjugated people. Now that we are in this, 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 this conundrum, the church has to become aggressively active in ensuring that we have deracialized politics and a more equitable human agenda. Thank you. Now, um, time is moving very fast and I think it, it feels as if we just got the conversation going. But like Jalani said, uh, I think it, this struck me, you were saying that all these um, structures are there. You know, I, I, or you were talking about earlier that there's already this knowledge, but we are not moving from the knowledge to, uh, knowledge to act on it. And the call to action is very strong. And if all of us just glance at the, the chat box, I think there are some of, some of our participants are not only not asking questions, they're actually offering comments and uh, uh, sharing with us what they think um, is some ways forward. And I guess the most important thing is we want to just uh, move into action as well. But today, uh, one of the values of this discussion really is that we are in solidarity together from different religious traditions, different faith traditions. And perhaps 
each of you could share something a bit more personal of your own journey and just as a close, you know, what are your some closing reflections and comments as you have shared your perspective, you have heard from others and we have engaged in um, some brief conversation uh, because this is really part of a process in Nefea that we would like to encourage where we want to move towards a joint message from different faith communities, um, at least speaking out and just articulating some of these thoughts that you have uh, given us. Um, so basically just asking you to give us some closing thoughts, closing comments, either from your own tradition or inspired by what you have heard from others, or even in, in what ways are you challenged uh, after uh, our conversation uh, thus far? So I'm op opening to anyone uh, in, in no particular order of importance, but Yusuf, you have <laughs> uh, raised your uh, hand. Go ahead. I, I'll just say, because I think this kind of might be a good comment that when um, when E.F. Schumacher wrote his book, Small is Beautiful, <clears throat> and he had this landmark chapter of Buddhist economics. It's a shame that Anne's not here today because she could have given us the perspective on that. But interestingly, in his concluding remarks on that chapter, he said, I could just as well have used Christian, Islamic, um, and because he said the ultimate uh, meta principles of all of the great wisdom traditions that we have are all consistent on this basis. It's an idea of who we are, who God is, how we're connected in this stewardship, we're interconnected in this framework of being and what that requires for us to do. The specific idea of how the financial world has evolved evolved as um, uh, Jahlani said, uh, he kind of gave this premise of the, that Hobbesian world, war against all against all, that actually arose out of a philosophy of separation. It was backed up by a philosophical framework that was literally separating God from the, from the universe, firstly in the form of a deistic God, God up there, the watchmaker God, and then relegating that God further and further in a more mechanistic worldview where God is just, you know, the ghost in the machine, right? The, all human beings are reduced is, is this kind of, we're just, um, epi, you know, to think of consciousness is an epiphenomenon. It's not even real. What's real is it, you know, abstract, sorry, immaterial, you know, just basic matter. And this kind of, a philosophy is what allows for this uh, alienating uh, dimension of finance and, um, uh, and, econ and economics. And so it's not, even though you brought us from supposedly contrasting spiritual traditions, I'm pretty sure when we come down to the spiritual meta principles, let's take away the theological kind of arguments, like the, the Quranic paradigm for speaking to the Ahl al-Kitab, which is a people of other religions and traditions, is let's come to common terms of the divine first. Because if we understand the ontological God, the God of being, after that, some of this other stuff can, can be, you know, you can hold on to your creed as much as you want, but that's a secondary level, right? The first level of that God of being is where we all come on that common terms. And that, that level of experience allows us to have a shared sense of spirituality in terms of what we think needs to be augmented in this world, right? And so, so even though I'm coming from the Muslim tradition, and I think there are a lot of amazing structural guidelines and imperatives, I'm pretty sure if I was to share them, or even some of the analogy that Karen gave at the beginning about, you know, she's, she spoke about being one body. This is a prophetic phrase in Islam as well, that the humanity is one body, right? And then, and he was sent to all of, as a mercy, the word used is Rahma, which means a mercy to all being and rahma is an interesting word it's often understood as mercy and compassion it really means the love of non-separation because the best example of rahma the prophet said was the female womb where there's a child in that womb but yet there's you think there's two but really there's just one because the breath of that child is the breath of the mother so we're never separate from god god isn't something separate god is the very ground of our being and we're being called to realize that through everything we have, through our technology, through our society, through our economics, through our finance, because that's the very basis of life itself, to realize that experientially, not theologically from a mind base, but experientially to be a witness unto God. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm, I, I think we have in our traditions, in all of our mystic cores of our traditions. Thank so you, we're just sir. being asked to be true to that. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'll, I'll let Jalani have the last word afterwards, but let David or Karen Georgia, any final thoughts from, from you? 
I'll, I'll, I'll go last day or unless some, you want me to go next. <laughs> or Cameron Georgia would like to share or Jalani, anyone would like to just give some your know, final comments? So um, in, in, in closing, um, one of the things that I want to point to because I think it's a good plan is the CARICOM Reparations oh. Commission 10 point um, reparation plan. Um, I think it's succinct and I think it has um, a lot of merit and, and substance in terms of what it calls for. I think also um, this is, a, this is a, 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 an interfaith um, conversation on this particular issue. And I've been asked to speak from the Christian context. And I think that there, um, there needs to be some kind of interrogation um, or um, you know, um, exhaustive look at um, how churches have amassed wealth right? Um, in, um, in the U.S. and in Europe, there, there are lots of endowments in our churches that are tied to a history that is tainted. And I think that there needs to be some kind of truth-telling that happens um, in the church, particularly around um, the global oh. oppressions of people. It is not just an African or an African descendant issue, although it's very glaring there. Um, but similar things also happened um, across Asia. Someone lifted up um, issues around India um, and, and other parts of the world. And so how, how can we come to um, a place of, of truth telling and right relationship that actually gets us to a place that says, um, uh, this is this is where accountability lies because, as Jelani pointed out in his presentation, these conversations about reparations are not new, and the question is how do we move from conversation into some kind of active engagement that allows for um, the development, the economic development that needs to happen. Um, to provide restitution for um, African and African descendant people. Thank you, Karen Georgia. Jalani or David, either All one right. of you. Jalani, I, you can go first. I, yeah. um, I, I wanna thank the, the conveners for um, bringing this panel of resources together. It's, it's a good way to know who is around us and um, who we can have this, this common conversation with. Um, I'm glad to have met my fellow Jamaican, Karen Georgia, and the rest of the panel, David, um, Youssef, uh, um, et cetera. I, I am mindful of the fact that Rastafari has a concept of I and I, um, which is not um, dissimilar from what we know um, in South Africa as Ubuntu. Um, really that I am because of you uh, and that we as a human, uh, planet, a planet, not just the human community, but we as a planet are connected to the things around us. COVID is showing us that in a real way, even the unseen we are connected to. Uh, and, and to that extent, I am suggesting that we need to remember that our skin hues are really very much superficial. But the last thing I wanna say is that we have tried the Eurocentric method for the last 500 years. And I think there is an important and urgent need now to understand Africa as method, Africa as root, not just for Africans, but for humanity. Mm -hmm. And to look at that continent as resourced adequately to solve its problems respectfully, which means centering Africa in all the conversations in the way that Europe has benefited from centering. Thank you, Shalani. And David. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all so very much. Uh, you know, and as uh, and thanks, of course, to the organizers for bringing us all together. Um, I think I think it's important to note, like as as Jelani noted, like we are all come from the same place, uh, and and we often uh, forget that. And I think that allows us to. It's one of the things that allows us to treat each other poorly when we otherwise shouldn't. And as Yosef noted. Uh, this, you know, we theologically, uh, these are all values that we share across our faith traditions. Um, uh, 
that you know uh, obviously also something that uh, you know that uh, Karen Georgia brought up is like this if these are still uh, minority perspectives clearly in practice if if not you know the yes our texts and our traditions clearly say this but in practice obviously uh, the, the most of the people in the world in power are people of of faith in the sense that they they hold by a religion, but nonetheless do not practice it this way. And in this in this sense, we are in the the minority uh, of of the world of of, of uh, preaching these these perspectives, and that can be a very lonely uh, uh, work to do. And so, I greatly appreciate uh, the the solidarity of being with you with you all here, uh, because it is. Uh, it is exactly this sort of conversation that, that really helps uh, to, to keep me going. Uh, and and the, the last thing I wanna, wanna bring up is that uh, I would be remiss not to mention that, that it, this is not in a vacuum, that we do not uh, treat each other well as, as people, as, as far as the society goes, right? Uh, it has other sorts of repercussions uh, and it's the same a lot of the same problems that are driving uh, humanity, the way that we treat our earth, our home, and that, that, that our poor treatment of the earth also has very negative consequences for, for us as people. And particularly uh, is a complicating, negative complicating factor uh, in it for, for people who are the, the poorest among us and the least resourced among us uh, is our continual uh, uh, neglect of properly addressing climate change and other in forms of environmental pollution. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I've brought in a very important person and one of my fellow organizers uh, from World Council of Churches, Athena. Uh, and I think on behalf of the LWF, WCRC, World Communion of Reformed Churches and the Council of World Mission and WCC. Of course, we are grateful to our four panelists for giving us so much to chew on, so much to think about. And I think the, the call to action also was very much present besides the, the, the sense of solidarity that we have with, with one another. So thank you once again very much. I'll pass the time to Athena as she wraps up. So uh, Athena, over to you. Thank you, thank you really to everyone um, for a powerful dialogue um, uh, for transformation. And I just wanted to say, oh, perhaps I should introduce myself properly. I'm Athena Peralta and I work with the World Council of Churches as Program Executive for Economic and Ecological Justice. Uh, I wanted to say that this panel is, discussion is not just a one-off thing. Uh, as it is part of an interfaith um, online consultation uh, on the same theme uh, comprised of three sessions. So we will have two further sessions um, that will go much deeper um, into the questions um, um, that um, have been raised um, um, at this uh, panel. Uh, this interfaith um, e-consultation will critically reflect from faith perspectives on the problem of death, um, especially made more urgent now by COVID-19 and also by climate change. Uh, we are also going to reflect uh, on alternative uh, pathways uh, for justice um, and sustainability uh, rooted um, you know, in our faith teachings um, in finance. Uh, this uh, uh, consultation will, or will, um, help to identify common ground and possibilities uh, for interfaith um, action to tackle not just a debt crisis, um, but also uh, to promote reparations and larger and more deep-seated uh, transformations in our international um, financial architecture. So more concretely, um, we hope that at the end of these three sessions, um, we will be able to develop a common message that we can share with our constituencies, but also with international financial institutions, as it happens, the IMF and the World Bank um, will be having their annual meetings um, uh, in October, uh, but also with the G20 and uh, their upcoming leaders summit in November. 
So again, thank you, thank you so much. And back to you, Sivin. So thank you uh, once again to all our participants. Please, please feel free to uh, leave your contact or if you have any links to your own work uh, in this area. But do remember uh, to send it, to click on to pa all panelists and attendees. Then uh, everyone can have a quick glance of where you're from and what you are doing. And, our, our, and I'm sure our panelists might be interested to engage with you further. Um, and we will be making this recording available um, after probably with some editing in there just to tighten things up a little bit more. And also there may be some resources that our panelists may wish to share with you. I think they will just send it to us and we will uh, send a follow-up email with all the, the necessary information. And of course, um, once again, thank you our panelists for spending this time with us, whether it's the morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are, and also to all the participants. So uh, we'll just leave the chat for a while uh, so that you can just make some final comments for all the participants. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. So thank you, Jalani. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, David. And thank you, Karen Georgia. And of course, Athena and my colleague, uh, Philip Peacock, and also Peter, uh, who are working behind the scenes. So uh, we are looking forward to keep in touch with all of you. So have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.